From a closet, also known as the Jim McCarthy VoiceOvers World Headquarters Studio, this is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com forward slash podcast. This is episode, I want to say 51 of the JMVO Weekly Primer. Yeah, we're back in the closet because I've been taking the show on the road for the past few episodes. And, you know, we call it the JMVO Weekly Primer. And uh, to be quite honest with you, it hasn't exactly been weekly. So it's more like the JMVO Weekly-ish Primer or even Monthly Primer. So I apologize for that. Uh, On the heels of the last show where we talked about selling and being creative, this is going to be another interesting episode talking about how to be creative. But first things first, of course, the primer is all about making your life better through marinating your mind in good stuff. My name is Jim McCarthy, owner, operator, and chief bottle washer at JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. And I believe that as business owners and entrepreneurs, we are bombarded by negativity every day. That's the last thing we need. If you want to see your life and business change for the better, consume nurturing good stuff. As usual, the primer is brought to you by Big Dot Lighting and Electrical. We are a Middle Tennessee commercial and residential services company that specializes in converting your business to energy efficient LED lighting. Check us out at big.lighting.com or big.electrical.com. Uh, we still have that a couple of different specials going on, including um, uh, high bay lighting that you can actually get installed for as low as, I want to say, 289 a fixture, just depending on what you're needing. You know those big basketball lights that you see in some of these facilities, and you, you turn them on, they're dim. You got to wait for them to warm up, and they're they're buzzing and everything. We change those out to much more efficient fixtures, and they're much brighter, more efficient, uh, and of course, uh, more energy efficient as well. So uh, hit us up, contact us, and find out more. So my guest today, uh, I had met when I was about five years into my radio career. I made the big move. My my wife to be and myself made the big move out west to Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, little did I know, I had met this person through. No, I didn't really meet him, but I I knew of him through a uh, parody song that he had written and produced. And, uh, uh, well, he didn't voice it, but, uh, I think a girl in the building might have voiced it. There was a little bit of a, um, controversy at the time between, uh, a rapper named Eminem might've heard of him and an artist named, uh, Christina Aguilera. And he was taking shots, pot shots at her and some of his stuff. And I, I can't remember if the story was that she just wasn't responding or retaliating, but, uh, I remember being at my first radio station in Danbury, Connecticut, the home of rock and roll, I-95, <laughs> and uh, reading about this song that was getting airplay through, I want to say, you know, different radio stations around the country. So my pal produced this song, this, this, this uh, parody remake, if you will, posing as Christina Aguilera responding to Eminem. So everybody was all over it. Bill Phillips, body for life checking in, man. Good to see you, brother. Absolutely. Let's do another talk. And to continue the story, he's he's basically takes the song, writes it, puts it out there. I read about it while I'm still in Danbury, Connecticut. So we move out to Vegas. Lo and behold, I meet Spence. And he's the one who actually wrote. Is that how it went down? I'll bring you on right now. Yeah, basically, uh, you know, it was all this talk about Christina Aguilera and Eminem. And, and we found a girl, a local singer, and uh, her last name was Ellis, I think. And we had her sing it like, like, uh, like Christina. And what we did, if I remember correctly, because I wasn't on the morning show at 98.5 KLUC in You're Vegas. You're the production at the director at the time. Yeah, I, uh, we, we teased it that an envelope came in that said CA Productions on it. You know, like Christina Aguilera. That's very clever, right? So, so we put the thing out and what was amazing, and I've done, you know, I think the lowest level of comedy is parody song. And I didn't yeah. used to think that, but then you watch The Office and you realize that's what Michael Scott does. <laughs> yeah. and, and, then I, and then you come to the realization, boy, you are in the bottom part of the totem pole when it comes to entertainment. 
But this, <laughs> <laughs> the part of the totem pole that's in the ground. Yeah, it's the support part. <laughs> right. It's the one that's encased in cement. <laughs> but in this particular case, like you mentioned, you, you we didn't know each other and you got it in Danbury. Yeah. Uh, that song got played all over the world. We had reports of it in Tokyo, in Munich, oh my New York City at Z100 New York. The thing yeah. was in their top eight for like two weeks. We, we went through different sources. And, and true story, um, I just grabbed this off the wall of my studio. I don't know if you'll I don't know if you're able to see it, but this is yeah, from yeah. the Chicago Sun Times. And this is a picture of a much younger me uh, with hair. Yeah, I remember seeing that actually. Was that in Cat's office? Cat's uh, no, office I, at the time? From, um, from my boss's office. No, I, the uh, record guy sent this to me because we explored trying to find out if we could, uh, you know, make money on it because it was getting plays all over the world. Now, was um, that your that, first, your first big like hit, so to speak? We had one other one when <laughs> we decided to do. Well, there's been three that I can remember. His uh, his biggest successes came with impersonating other people. <laughs> yeah, with 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 stealing somebody else's art and changing the word. That's great. So proud of me, aren't you, Mom? No, the um, the first one we did was that that got some notoriety. Was we did a parody of remember getting jiggy with it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did one. We did a Laverne and Shirley version called "Getting Squiggy with It," right? And and Nickelodeon actually contacted us and wanted to use it maybe to run or Nickelodeon or or uh, Nick at Night. Yeah, Nick at Night. They wanted to run it as a promo or something, and I don't think they could get it cleared. And then more recently, uh, there's a song by Camila Cabello, and uh, it's called Havana. Mm -hmm. um, and we did a version called Nevada obviously because that's where we're at and it makes fun of reno and and how great vegas is and that that thing which for a lot of people this isn't huge numbers but for us being a radio station and a parody thing we got six hundred thousand views on facebook uh and wow. another another couple hundred thousand on on youtube um so <clears throat> so you hit them every once in a while and so my career that's one every eight years so i should have one more left in my in my career uh, I think you're gonna have a lot more, but I just want to point out the fact that I, yes, I am drinking from a mason jar. I've been in the South way too long. <laughs> well, it's good to see that all your fruit is fried. And uh... <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that when I, you know, when when you and I first met, we obviously didn't realize we were to become as good of friends. And I've been uh, harping on this particular episode being the creativity episode and talking about how to be creative. So take that as about as much of a compliment I'm going to give you at this point. Thanks so. buddy. Yeah, well, the biggest compliment I've ever had from a guy drinking out of a Mason jar <laughs> in Tennessee, <laughs> right, let me write that one sitting down. in a closet. <laughs> hey, I'm in a, I'm in a bedroom. And if I looked straight ahead, the closet where I record stuff is right there. You know, the closets work out fantastic, man. Um, I could see behind you, actually, when you were getting the microphone, the space behind you is evident of a creative, a little bit uh, chaotic and messy, and but, you know, that's okay. Well, that's uh, part of the deal. If I may say, this S behind me. What does it stand uh, for? Well, Spence. Oh, oh, that's I, right. I took it that way, but I actually, it came off the building at, at our Las Vegas studio. <laughs> I was wondering, because it looks like the S in CBS. <laughs> <laughs> when when intercom purchased CBS, yeah, that, that actually was on our building. This S, and then this room I'm in, you can see the beautiful sunset behind. Yes. Um, when we bought the house, we're like, that has got to go. That is the most obnoxious, cheesy thing. And now, after producing so much stuff in this room, what I call my studio, and uh, making my daughter sleep on the couch because she mm -hmm. doesn't have her own room because it's my studio. It's my um, I, I I really believe that this has some sort of religious power, <laughs> religious <laughs> creative power that if I take down the cheesy sunset uh, wallpaper, uh, everything will evaporate. Well, the wallpaper uh, maybe harkens back to your time in Hawaii because uh, Stephanie, your wife, is Hawaiian. Yep. Right. Yeah. She. So, uh, we bought the house. That's why we bought the house. Well, look, it's like home. You'll feel. You'll feel just like home. <laughs> yeah, in this the, room. the wall mural just makes it. You know everything. It just brings us right to that particular point. And Absolutely. you can. You can just barely see the texture of the wall behind the wallpaper. So it looks <laughs> like a. It's amazing. The popcorn texture. Yeah. So there are a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs out there. Entrepreneurship is a huge buzzword these days. Uh, everybody's got it. Well, 
most everybody has it in their Instagram profiles, their, you know, Twitter profiles, all that kind of stuff. And everybody wants to have a podcast these days. (laughs) So part of the reason being of having you on is that you've been a part of a, well, let's just say it's it's a major market morning show. Uh, for the past, gosh, it's been probably what, 15, uh, uh, five years, five years, um, (laughs) since like, uh, 2000. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, a a lot of it is due in part to your, you, you you're truly one of the most creative people I've ever met. And whenever you and I have put our heads together, we create some pretty cool stuff. I mean, that's one of the things I, things I miss about being in Vegas is working with you. Uh, cause we had our studios next to each other, uh, because w- I worked for the redhead stepchild AM stations, uh, yeah. Spence was working for the, you know, the big powerhouse cash machine radio station AM. and right. <laughs> and he had all the good toys and everything. And the, 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 the stuff that made, you know, all the stuff I read about in trade magazines that, uh, actually it was funny. Cause when Gavin told me or hired me. He said that they had the thing that I saw in uh, trade magazines, the production, the Orban, right? The Odyssey. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and at the time, it was like a $40,000 boat anchor. And uh, I love so that this thing, thing though. Uh, you know, a lot of guys did, and they did great work on it. A lot of the, you know, the imaging work, radio imaging that uh, is, if, if you hear me say imaging for the layman, we're talking about the stuff that you hear between the songs on a radio station. Spence and I were kind of in charge of that. He was, he was in charge of it for the uh, top 40 music station, KLUC. I was in charge of it for the AM talk stations. I used to, you know, do imaging for mono, which is fun. And to get, to give an idea, cause a lot of people do audio stuff on their computer and you basically have right. your computer and I have pro tools on mine and, and I use a regular Apple keyboard and everything else. It's, it's and I, this thing was, this this appliance awesome. that you used it yeah. was it was a transition from using when we cut tape and editing tape into into digital and it right. had all the buttons and everything was on this this I would say it was as big as a uh, a Great Dane the length of a Great <laughs> Dane right it, it, if you take a traditional um, laundry basket the surface area of the opening it's about the surface area of the yeah interface was about that big and it had a big old honking monitor on it that was literally it was a cr crt cathode ray tube not monitor it wasn't even a flat screen at the time <laughs> but i mean it was literally i mean i think it actually came with its own separate uh, uh module for storage and that, that thing was like the size of a honda civic from yeah it was huge yeah we moved out there and um i was pretty creative in connecticut i think I brought, I, I would like to say I brought the level of production and creativity amongst all the team members there up a notch with my presence and, Agreed. you know, not to pat myself on the back, but literally I move out to Vegas and my level of, um, you know, it's truly the old adage of, if you want to become better, surround yourself with people who are better than you. And by virtue of being in that environment, Truly, my talents really did go to another level. I learned more about audio processing and equalization and compression and things of that nature Um, and from everybody in the building. But I mean, from you, it was mostly just kind of gleaning the and getting inspired by hearing what you were doing in the next studio, which you typically were blaring. Uh, You know, we had we had soundproof studios and we could hear every I could hear because you you'd have these massive productions and typically, you, 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 because everything was on the fly using the Orban, there was no, if you, if you know anything about audio production or video production, you know you can set the volume levels and put little envelopes and different points and stuff like that in today's software. Back then, you were literally handling all yeah. eight faders and trying to fade things on the fly as you were feeding it into the system. Right. It truly took a, a whole le- another level of talent. And the most entertaining thing was hearing you just go ape crap <laughs> and get so frustrated because you just one little thing would be off and you'd have to start the whole thing. All I mean, it was, I mean, it was hilarious. I wish I recorded some of those things. I, uh, hilarious. And I, I'm, I am a very colorful language uh, when I'm not happy. <laughs> You? And because uh, see, back in the day in radio, it's very similar. You'd have you'd have to record onto cart carts cartridges. They were basically a loop of tape, and a and a, and a, you basically would record on it. So if you did anything grandiose in that situation, you might have 
six or seven different elements that you're using. You might be playing music off a CD and then punching sound effects off another cart and you're, and, and you're talking. So you're trying to do all of it and mix it onto that cart. So as digital came along and in the example you used, it was kind of the same thing, except you didn't have to talk. So it should be easier, but you just want, you know, and that's why the mu everything would be blasting because I want to hear the subtleties of what's going where and, and, and invariably, and because many of us that do what we do are perfectionists, it, it, it doesn't get right. And about after the eighth, tenth try, it, it's a little exasperating. And, and I, you know what? I've been talking with a therapist. I'm not cursing and yelling as much. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, is looking at the way you used to mix that. Your, your ears after a while do get Act like um, I guess acclimated to the noise coming out of the speakers, so you you start losing those nuances. You have to leave the room, take a walk around the building, and then come back after ten minutes to get your palate cleaned. I guess you would well, say. Well, it's I mean, the same. It's, it's the same true. idea as if uh, you get rotisserie chicken and you throw the parts in the garbage can and you leave right. them in the garbage can in the kitchen, and then you come home from work and you're like, "Oh my god, what is that?" And then you get right. around to doing stuff and you're like, "Your nose blind." Same yeah. thing happens with your ears when you're when you're working things like Completely. that. Completely. And the other thing was the fact that Tracy and the team, who is a world class engineering team, <clears throat> most of the time, would uh, would basically have they they had the units so they were sideways and the speakers were this way in front of us, right? So if you're watching the video, you see me turning sideways. So. Spence would be playing this thing sideways like a piano, but all the speakers, the monitors would be hanging from the ceiling to his left, which I never understood because you go in any mixing studio, you got to, you know, get the stereo image and have both speakers on both sides of you. We can all, we can all, we can always do a full show on uh, engineers and why they're not normal people. <laughs> they really aren't. <laughs> they really are a whole separate breed. And radio engineers show. are a completely different s subset of human beings. But as we're getting into this thing, and I know we're kind of uh, just having fun, but the big thing we want to talk about is creativity. Like I said, we got a lot of business owners out there. I see people trying to do podcasts with, you know, video and, um, you know, hearing different things and offerings on iTunes. Um, it's, it's good for someone like me because I can go in and say, Hey, heard your stuff. I can offer this and take the sound of your podcast up a notch. And a lot of people look for intros and outros, which has been my kind of thing, but yeah. I've been getting more and more into the actual content of what they're talking about because the amateur of amateur podcasts, you're going to hear, Hey, Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear me. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So what are you doing? Um, I'm sitting here talking to you. What's the weather like there? Oh, it's, oh my gosh, freaking stick a knife in my ear, you know? <clears throat> so a lot of what you, a lot of people, I guess, who truly understand the engaging aspect of doing a podcast uh, from doing stuff like what I normally do. I do this kind of for fun. It's a conversation, wherever it may go. We have some sort of a, of a direction that we want to take this thing, but the conversation goes where it goes. That's my fun aspect of it, of hosting this thing. But with that being said, where did you start coming up with like the little thing? Where did you start getting your, your creativity from? Like, you know, how did you start nurturing that? Were you always like that or? I never far as, I, as far as I can remember, um, and I, I've wanted to be in radio. Uh, I can tell you the time I was 12 years old and I was listening to a uh, KFRC in San Francisco, which was a legendary top 40. And they had a contest that if you wanted to write a poem for, about the 49ers. And I made up this poem and I called the radio station and, and, and I made it and I, and I called and I heard myself on the air and I jumped, I jumped through the roof. I was so excited. I made it on the radio. And, and I, I got a 49er pennant in the mail a couple weeks later. Cause back That's then, cool. yeah, no, it's awesome. But I knew that minute I wanted to be in radio. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I look back to, we lived in a, a townhouse and it had um, central heat and air. So in the upstairs, they had those vents on the floor. And mm -hmm. the vents downstairs were up on the ceiling, and that's how the heat and air were dispersed. And I used to do radio shows through the vents. Take one of those old cassette decks, you know, with a handle on them, and I'd have the music on a cassette, and I would talk into the, I'd talk right down into the floor, and then mm -hmm. play the music, and it was basically spread throughout 
the entire house, much to the chagrin of my mom and, <laughs> and everybody else that lived there. So the creativity part, I think it was always there. And what, what I find fascinating is we talked earlier about parody songs. Honestly, if you look back to that story from KFRC when I was 12, I was doing that. I wrote a poem, which basically is song lyrics, if you put it to music. So I think I've always just been, especially musically creative and just kind of, uh, am kind of fueled by that, you know? Just a little bit special. Yeah. And I, and I, here's what's so funny is I'm a crap musician. I, I, uh, I can sing a little bit. You can get the, you get the job done. I, well, I can, I can sing. I can sing okay. I'm awful at the piano and awful at the guitar. It doesn't, it's one thing though, it doesn't stop me. I'll figure a way around something that I am not talented enough to do. You know what I mean? Like I'd love to turn around and, and play the piano and play you a song, but I'd probably screw it up. But I can find an outlet for the creativity that doesn't involve me necessarily doing all of the work. Well, I think as long as you have a way to record it and edit it. You'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. And that's that's the biggest tools to have. It's like having a I've told people that work in radio that that are working part time that the real the real tool, the real treasure they have is the key that gets you in the door. Cause once you get in the door, then then the whole world's open up to you can do whatever you want. Same thing with having recording equipment. Once you have that equipment, that enables you to teach yourself and learn and experiment and, and hopefully come up with something cool. Was there ever any, anybody other than me in your life that uh, inspired you to uh, make yourself better? Well, I got to be honest, Jerry. I think that you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and what's what's really like you said earlier, surrounding yourself with people that that uh, that are more talented. That's why where I work now presently. That's why I'm, <clears throat> I've, I've reached a plateau and I'm stunted. Is because everybody's kind of mediocre. Right. But back when you were there. Um, yeah, it's it's not pretty just, cool stuff, man. It's not just the creativity of producing something or, or coming up with something. It's the whole environment. And and uh, you know, you and I used to have <laughs> we used to have certain days of the week. And this is important because it's all <laughs> part of creativity. Yeah. We would decide that Tuesday was was professional wrestler day, and we would only address each other as professional as a professional wrestler would That's sound. Right. <laughs> and then and then we have you know for you old schoolers we had mr roper day and yeah. basically what that was is is you'd make a joke and then and then you look off at the camera like mr roper and three's company and now yeah. more, more <laughs> modern version would be doing jim from the office jim Halpert, right yeah jim Halpert, and just kind of yeah that kind of thing but right. that type of atmosphere where we're kind of bouncing each other off. I started doing a, uh, I've started doing a, a video series called just Spence's horoscopes. Uh, it's got, <laughs> it's gotten 63 views on Facebook. Nice. But it's just a, it's just stupid. It's stupid, non sequitur, whatever. But I've enlisted a couple of friends of mine that are, that are pretty good writers and kind of crazy. And so we kind of bounce ideas off each other. And that kind of really does fuel creativity. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, I find that whenever I conversate aloud and even on a phone call, when you start really talking about an idea, you'll find that other ideas start to manifest themselves in those, in those areas. But, but specifically for a podcast, being that you're, you know, you've been part of a morning show for this long and you attend things like morning show boot camps, which a lot of podcasters aren't even aware of these things. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ideas that you glean from these types of either conventions or some of the um, show elements and features that you come up with that some of these podcasters that listen to this stuff could actually start thinking about and employing in their own shows? You know, in podcasting, radio is kind of late, late to the game with podcasting, but being at morning show boot camp is a, uh, it's basically a convention for radio morning shows. Uh, it was in Chicago just about a month ago. Um, it's just finding your unique voice, I think, and not being afraid to try anything. So many people don't seem to understand that you're not going to get a bunch of viewers and a bunch of followers just right off the bat. It, unless you're some well-known name uh, you know, that, that does it, a Joe Rogan or whomever that has that built-in celebrity yeah. You're not. So there is nothing wrong with throwing stuff against the wall and exploring different things and, and trying to find 
your little niche. Because as you mentioned earlier, everybody's doing it. Everybody wants to do it. And if you're going to do, like you said, just, uh, hey, uh, look, I've got a podcast. If you enjoy it, do it. If it's a creative outlet and you have fun, whether it, it's successful or not, do it. But the main thing is to find what exactly is going to, what exactly from your personality or your idea is different. You know, I, I, we're big fans of, of drunk history and things like that. And uh, mm. my program director sent me, hey, is there, a, is there an audio podcast equivalent? There probably is. I don't know. But I don't want to do that. It's already been done. And it's yeah. done really well. So there's a really good chance I'm going to do a poor job of it. That's the hardest part is you've got to try to find what is going to be different and what's going to make noise that that isn't already being heard or just being a larger than life personality if that's who you are i mean and and i think you do have to have it's let let's look at it this way if you're doing a podcast it's entertainment it, yeah. it, it period and if you're not gonna put some showbiz i do a podcast called the church of spenstology and i try to do it weekly and it's just me and that's mm -hmm. hard and, I, and I've, I've been trying to find a good voiceover company to do the ins and outs, but my buddy Jim won't return my calls. So I just, I'm kidding. <laughs> You've never even <laughs> called me. Oh, it was my buddy Jerry. Um, <laughs> Jerry McCarthy. So, <laughs> he's really talented. <laughs> it's, it's just a matter of, I, I honestly believe, try stuff. And if it yeah. doesn't feel right after a few episodes or whatever, then change it up and do something else. You're... You're not going to embarrass yourself. And if you do, maybe that's the key, <laughs> you know? Well, it's funny. I'm doing a, um, a podcast with Rich Redmond, who you met when you were here out in a visit. He's, uh, he, he plays for, he's been playing for Jason Aldean for 20 years almost now. Yeah, and they're coming he, back uh, out to Vegas soon. And uh, after 1 October, they're actually coming back out. Yeah, yeah. I think, they're, uh, I think they're doing a, um, they're doing three dates out of one of the casinos out there. I can't remember yeah. the name of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he, he and I are doing this whole new, we're calling it the rich Redmond show. We just released the, uh, first three episodes at once and we're doing the video components of that. Cause we do have, we make it a video and audio offering. So we get introduced people via the video and they could see who we're interviewing and things of that nature. But you can, yeah, you can go to iTunes and listen to it whenever you want and consume it. However you like, uh, that's the whole idea of it. But he said, you know, we, I think we've recorded like three or four shows in one day. And uh, he's like, oh, my gosh, that was exhausting. You know, we were talking for three or four hours. I'm like, dude, people do this every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> said, that's, that's, that's the thing is that, you know, imagine having to do this every day and be fresh and be energetic and be original and have ideas flowing. I said, yeah. it's, it's a lot tougher than you think. No, it really is. Out there. It's like, dude, you, you always wanted a radio show. No, there's no gate uh, gatekeepers anymore. No content, you know, as they constantly tell us in radio and probably throughout the podcasting world, content is king. And I hate that cliche, but the fact is you've got to mine it. You've got to search for it. And if you're lucky, it'll hit you over the head and it's there. But you really have to try to find that content and, and deliver it in a way that's going to make people watch or listen. Now, let me ask you this. Do you have the discipline to come up with something every day or every week? Like, what is your what is your commandment of thyself to, to do something for the radio station in the morning show? Then you repurpose it for other outlets, I think, right? Yeah, I try to, you know, there's so many different parts to my job at the radio station now that I'm not a, a production guy. I'm on a morning show. But yeah, I, I try to come up with something every day. Um, like you mentioned, I make, make a parody song that's specific to Las Vegas. I'll try to figure out a way to sell it to, a, you know, as freelance so it'll get played else, elsewhere across the across the country um but th the key as you mentioned earlier is having the, the ability to record so if i do come up with something uh, i'm right down the hallway and i can i can get it done but i try to commit uh, with the podcast i try to commit to one a week and right. and i really do believe that the consistency if you're trying to really build something i, I you've got to be consistent otherwise it just makes it harder for you well, I mean, the consistency is always also going to feed into your creativity as well, because you'll. I think you're going to manifest more ideas that way. It's a muscle. It's a muscle, and if you you don't <clears throat> keep using it, it it. Uh, they, they even say like with with people getting older, 
the, the people that keep active with crossword puzzles or Sudoku or whatever, and their, their brains are constantly active, as they get older, their brain tends to remain pretty active. And I think mm -hmm. with your, the creative muscle in your brain, if you're not constantly trying to find an angle that can be used on the air or your podcast or, or wherever, y you do get out of practice and you get rusty. It was funny when I came back, well, when I moved to Nashville in 05 from Vegas, I'd spent four years out there and I moved out here to um, be the creative director for two stations. One was a, at the time, a light rock station, similar to 100.5 out in Vegas. And the other one was the Jack FM. And Jack at the time was just rolling out. If you're not familiar with Jack, it's essentially a jukebox as a radio station no DJs typically is the model <clears throat> and this snarky voice guy who said these really just, you know, things that were like, wow, that's, that sounds a lot different. The whole moniker of Jack was playing what we want, even though the music was well-researched and they did it, you know, the way they did it. Um, but coming up with those one liners for the voice guy to say, so they didn't get stale in the beginning was very intimidating. <clears throat> but then no, we and, got it's and it's hard because, you know, we all have our, perspective on comedy and what we think is funny and it's always tough when you go oh this is great oh, yeah. and then you tell it to the the creative types that you're working with and they're like yeah, yeah uh-huh oh my uh, gosh that's why you break off and do your own podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah fine i'll try it but it, all the stuff that i was told not to do in radio was all of a sudden free reign hey. well and the, the important thing to note about that particular <clears throat> format too is the is because it, it did not have any <laughs> talent it did not have any disc jockeys yeah it had to have a personality and the personality of the radio station was delivered through these one-liners yeah and, and you had to be really good at, so eventually we assembled a team it was the three of us marty link trent pender myself and uh am among the three of us we came up with, with some pretty good stuff and addressing exactly what you were talking about when i thought i would come up with a series of lines and stuff like that where oh my gosh this is gold and marty and moose marty moose well, Trent was called Moose. We called him Moose. Marty and Moose would read. We'd all get in the same room and go through each other's two pages that we submitted a week. So we had six pages that we whittled down to two. It was humbling. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, you get to your, you're like, yeah, they're, they're going to love this one. And then they read it. And then you'd go, they're not laughing. <laughs> this guy. No, you know, <laughs> creativity is a tightrope, especially when you're, when you're doing something like that. I, I did uh, for a brief uh time i was doing stand-up and uh really? yeah i did it i did it at brad garrett's yeah. comedy club i hosted there a couple nights at the tropicana here in vegas brad and garrett. I opened up for brad garrett yeah uh, i opened up for brad garrett there you go um, the throwing yourself out like that in the same situation with you know your creativity for your podcast or, or what you're saying is the worst thing i could do is was run a joke past my wife because I'd tell the, I'd set up and tell the joke, and she'd look like yeah. that, and I, and it, then it would kill every ounce of confidence I had in it because she just doesn't think I'm funny, and and I'm sure is meeting with a lawyer as we speak. <laughs> but what you're saying though, it can be humbling, but you've got to continue to write and not let those little things deter you because if you do. Just don't do it. Honestly, don't do it. You can't be that thin skinned when you're trying to come up with content. Because while you may have a great idea, sometimes your blinders are on and you don't really realize that it's not that good. For me, hey, though, Peter. I just keep going. I don't care. Peter Sorensen chiming in. Hey, Peter on a car phone. Thank you. We used to uh, talk about We had Tom Likas as one of our uh, talk show hosts. Son. No, that's, a, that's an inside joke. That wasn't very Oh, funny. I got you. Hi, Peter. I yeah. He, he, he and I would see each other in the hallway and be like, hey, Jim McCarthy on a car, for car phone. You're on the Tom Likas show. Hello. That was, the, uh, that, was a, that was the thing that Likas would say whenever he had a caller on. But yeah, car I guess phone, you had, no longer a term, terminology we use. I know. It, it was car phone back then. That's funny. Hello. Um, but I mean, that's a, it's a big part of it is, is, is getting in the daily grind and, and it becomes, it, it is work after a while. I mean, as, as fun as creativity sounds, it's, uh, it does take a lot of work. I mean, what were some? What was the uh, the one thing you and I did together that you were the most proud of? That comes to mind immediately. You have to understand. Uh, I have a uh, a smallish brain that's been pickled by years of bourbon. Uh, so, I, my honest to God, I uh, my memory of stuff 
it isn't phenomenal. And sometimes I'll go through my my uh, my backup drives, and I'll mm-hmm. I'll find so what's this? And I'll play, and I go, I don't remember doing that. It's my voice. I produced it. That's actually pretty funny. When did I do that? Where did it come from? Honest to God. I think one of the best things we did, and it wasn't even when I was there with you, uh, was Dude Nipples. <laughs> ah, Dude Nipples. Yeah. That was, that was an original a song, song I, I wrote. I was, in a, I was speaking about comedy at a, at a UNLV class, and I was wearing, I was wearing one of those waffle, waffle uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, uh, I got the best shirt. And I'm I'm going around in this class thinking I'm smart in front of the you know the 18 to 22 year olds, and this one attractive girl goes, we were talking about what what inspires you, whatever it is, try it out. And she goes, how about the nipples in your shirt? <laughs> like, apparently, <laughs> apparently, and I was sh- I was shocked, and I'm like, I thought I looked good in this, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. And so then then I'm like, that's a great song, and so. I wrote a song and then uh, produced the piano, I believe, and sent it to you. And you put a drum track and put some ridiculous big uh, 80s uh, pop ballad voice on it. We, and- we did some BGVs on it, background vocals. Yeah. You, did, so it- you, you, did, you just sent me the raw track and I dressed it up a bit. We did some background vocals and I think I put a tambourine track on it. Uh, but <laughs> it, it's, it's a song hilarious. called Nipples and it talks about, you know, men... You know what they are. Moves. Yeah. I, I know exactly what they are. I have them. <laughs> That's They're why the wonderful. camera's right. The camera cuts off right at the neck. <laughs> and it's and it, and it's basically, you know, the camera is angled down so you don't see the uh the <laughs> buckle. <buck-lucka. laughs> I was in a band. You remember when I was I talk about the band that I was in when I was on like 18, 19, 20 years yeah, old. Yeah, you never you wouldn't shut up about it, actually. I, okay, thank you. And uh <laughs> Even that guy that I was in the band with, I mean, he would come up with some, I mean, some completely awful stuff yeah. for song ideas and lyrics, but at the same time, creative and pretty hilarious for, you know, being the, the at the time, the time that I was in at the, at, at that particular moment in my life, right. but <clears throat> just amazing. What was the, what was one of the biggest standouts that you've had in terms of a production that you've maybe done lately or that really stands out that uh, overall just, you know, you're really, yeah. I'm, I'm saddled with the responsibility of, of it's called Spence's song of the week. So every Friday I've got to come up with something, whether it's a parody song or whether it's an original song and it, it, trust me, it's taxing and I have to do it every week. Now, the guy I work with has said, hey, you know, if you don't have something, come in with a guitar and, you know, play a song called, I've got nothing. I had nothing today to say, whatever. Right. Um, and we've had a few that have done crazy. Here in Vegas, the Golden Knights uh, NHL hockey team came into play a couple of year, uh, the last couple of years. And I've done, I don't know how many different original songs just based on um, the team and Vegas. So I, I, uh, my hockey, my my playoff beard makes me look tough, and I I wrote a song that sounds like the Yippie Kaye, you know that kind of thing. Uh, our goalie Mark Andre Fleury jokingly put his finger in a, in a in a dude's ear in a bit of a skirmish, and we did a song about that. So a lot of the Golden Knights based stuff gets really good traction on Facebook and YouTube and on the and our our station website uh, because it's local. Um, and because you know people here are absolutely golden knights crazy and we do not like the predators jim just so you're aware i'm sorry yeah let's just let you know but i mean but that, I, will the, the, this, I will say this on a podcast thing locals a great place to go i, I think mm. and I, I don't know that much about podcasting right. uh, and i i don't know exactly how it works but if you go there first people I, I really believe media has really tried to regionalize and nationalize. And by doing that, it becomes generic and it becomes not personal. And I think for me in terrestrial radio, part of the still the lure to it is we talk about what's going on here. People can identify what's going on here. They can identify with places and people and things that happen in our town. And I, and I think podcasting, should be like that too, especially starting out with your business or whatever it might be. Talk to the people that are really interested and you can identify with first. And a lot of times those songs I'm talking about, 
are, are, I'll tell you a great one that did really well recently. If you ever drive from Vegas to California on the 15, there is a road that comes up outside of Baker, California, and it's, it's called Zizix Road. It's literally the last yeah. named street. Everybody knows this road, uh, ZZYZX. Mm -hmm. I took old, I you know, old town road, the, the Billy Ray Cyrus, little Nas X song. <laughs> I just did one called Zizix yeah. Road. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because everybody, everybody locally, when they go to California, and a lot of people do, uh, Labor Day weekend's coming up, they're going to go. And I wrote a song, I'm going to drive right past old Zizix Road. It's locally, people know it, they can identify with it, and you make it fun. By the way, I found out because I got an email from a guy, it's Zizix is how you pronounce it, really, which nobody knows. And at no. the end of Isaac's Road is a desert research center that the University of California has, UC Riverside and such. Really? And this, this dude emailed me and said, I saw my friend of mine link me to your video on Facebook uh, about Zizix Road. By the way, it's pronounced Zizix, but the song's great. But focusing locally like that or on things that people know, they love it. I, and I really do believe that personalized touch of localization can really help. Well, that thing that you talked about before with the uh, the hockey team uh, also touches a nerve too, because you were re I remember you really being passionate about about the uh, the, the Knights, right? Mm -hmm. So it certainly helped everything out. You know, as of late, and I get made fun of a lot for this. I've become a major Marvel fan, uh, you know, the movies, the Avengers and all that stuff. And being a dad, a husband, uh, you know, raising a family, you start to lose yourself because everything in my life has become about work and, and just making sure we're, we're moving forward and everything and trying to put some money away, all that stuff that comes along with adult responsibilities. And you start losing, at least I've, I've been finding over the past couple of years, losing myself in and and my creative edge if that makes sense so yeah, yeah. with the marvel stuff i've just been glomming onto it because and having a passion for it i haven't created anything based on it but it's fun and i think since i've been doing that like that creative bone has started to get a little bit harder <laughs> <laughs> uh you know but i also think this platform the podcast platform just having these conversations Hey, I always wanted to have a talk radio show. So Jim have at it and I do a horrible, I mean, I'm, I'm probably doing a lot better than Alan stock, but I mean, you know, that's, that doesn't say much, but you know, Alan stock, that's another, if Alan's listening to this, you know, I'm just joshing you pal. Hey, and, and what's great is, uh, he's a, he's a Las Vegas radio talk guy and has been, Yeah. and we had, you know, the storm 50 area 51 thing. And now oh, it's, been, gosh. it's been changed to, they're trying to do a concert called alien stock, but I just mm -hmm. take one of the letters out and pretend it's going to be. Alan stock. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, what's funny is I tweeted this out. I tweeted this out and I'm like, and I, I tagged him on it, but, but Alan's, uh, Alan's of an age that I think he checks his Twitter once every six to eight years. Yeah. So he, he, hasn't, he hasn't, he hasn't responded yet. I'm still on frackle, but I, I think your point is it, it's a, it's really important. Yeah. Th there is freedom in the, in, in the podcasting world to do, what you want, whether it's for your business and you're trying to, you know, make more money or out of sheer enjoyment, as you mentioned with the Marvel characters, finding yourself yeah. uh, and finding what makes you funny or what you like. So just do it and see what happens. The good thing with me doing podcasting and getting involved with other people who are doing it um, and, you know, helping them with their podcasts is that I start getting back in touch with the um, manifesting of ideas. So. I was a guest on a podcast for a pal of mine here locally, uh, and he's become known as like a somewhat of a local celebrity, I guess you could say, not really celebrity, but just well known because he 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 comments on this this local Facebook page, <clears throat> this I Heart Spring or no T Spring Hill I Heart it. There are two Facebook pages. One is a little bit more um, uh, goody two shoes. The other one's a little less savory, and <laughs> the stuff he comes up with is genius and i told him i said dude you you've got a gift for coming up with the stuff on social that gets engagement gets people talking so he he came up with his own podcast it's called price's highway his name is uh, steve price and what after we did his uh, podcast we started talking and i said you know we ought to just take this thing on the road at a local restaurant 
uh, some of the other guys that are more notorious for being on this, this, this Facebook page and do the podcast. I mean, even, even just call out people with stupid stuff on Facebook on these, these, these pages can be something really hilarious. He's like, that's a great idea. I said, I'm, I'm game if you are. I, I like that idea. And we've talked about doing this. Uh, we wanted to do a podcast where we take uh, three lawn chairs and we go to different parts of Las Vegas and we set them up and we do the podcast where kind of like mystery science theater, we just, we just talk mess about mm -hmm. anything and everything we see. So Fremont street experience is downtown Las Vegas. And oh my uh, gosh, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit crazy. Uh, yeah. The people that you see down there, but just sitting three guys in lawn chairs and we sit there, we record the whole podcast and do that. And then we, maybe we go to, you know, somewhere on the strip and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, Commenting on the tourists. Commenting, <laughs> commenting yeah. on that. Why people from Iowa love fanny packs so much. Or I, shiny I shirts. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's so many things that you tourists that come to my town wear that are absolutely ridiculous. That would be fun on a, on a local end. Now, what stops me from doing it and what stops a lot of people from creating and, and doing podcasts and things like that, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of um, bravery because you know if you're going to go down on the strip and do that, now while you're not broadcasting it over speakers, you're going to get messed with and you'd better have a sharp brain and sharp wit to fight back without fighting back. You know right. what I mean? So if it, the, I think the biggest thing in, in, in succeeding in a podcast is just getting it done and doing it and forcing yourself to accomplish it, which is the exact opposite of creativity because that fights creativity. But uh, I think it'd be fun. And I think well, it'd be great. That, but you, you, the, you, another good point you're bringing up is the fact of having to force something out, like you're having to come up with a song every Friday, and then ha re you're pretty much doing it by yourself, I would assume. You're not running it by anybody. You're not bound. I mean, are you bouncing it off somebody before you air it? Or are you pretty much just when it, when, well, I, as I mentioned before, I can't bounce it off, bounce anything off my wife like that because then I'll, I'll change, I'll write something else. Right. Um, but I mean, I there really has know. to be something that she likes. Then you know you got something good. Yeah, okay, I, I, I question your judgment. You know what I mean? I'm just yeah. yeah. There's um, one thing that actually comes to mind that was hilarious. I want to say maybe we were already here, but the oh man, was it one of the one of the the Olympics? was on and stephanie really got into one of the sports it was a great it was a great bit we did on the air we did a bit called um uh it was who what where is what was the name of the bit and i'm we're i'm upstairs at my house and and i hear my wife just going crazy i come down the stairs she's watching the u.s olympic swim team against germany and it's mm -hmm. some sort of relay mm -hmm. and she's up off the couch she's clapping she's just having a fit so i grabbed my recording and i put it on the on the end table and then we played it on the air but but it was like the gym it was like it was like oh, oh come on you can do it oh my god he's out of your bed you was you can oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah and she's doing the swimming motions oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah and we played it on the air and and it was it was it was okay who what where Okay, is my wife not doing what you think? She's actually watching swimming. <laughs> but what? But what is a good point of you bringing that up is you mm -hmm. never know. You never know what is going to strike your creativity. That right. seems pretty obvious. In that I'm like, oh my god, this is absolute gold, mm -hmm. and it can be anything. I have a I have tape from the Nevada legislature, and they're talking about you know brothels in in rural counties are are, are legal in Nevada. Yeah. And a buddy of mine who's a former assemblyman sent me audio that's on the website. And this guy decided to speak to the legislature about how brothels will be a thing of the past. And he starts talking about robot sex. Mm -hmm. And this audio of this guy, I really think that robots are coming in a time when men are tired of the dating world. You have all these apps, you have these women, and they don't want to deal with love. They don't want to fall in love. They just want to go and enjoy a woman's touch that's a robot. And he goes through this whole thing. And I'm listening to that going, oh my God, this is just, this is perfect. And it came out of nowhere. 
So you, I think creatively for your podcast, whatever, you've just, you've got to tune your ear. To find a different angle to find something funny. What did you know. do with it though? I just put on my podcast and made fun of the guy. I didn't really do anything creative with it. Oh, buddy. Here's something, speaking of tuning your ear, right? I'm listening to a podcast the other day by, you know, remember the Wolf of Wall Street? Remember that movie? Mm-hmm. You know who that guy is? Yeah. His name is Jordan Belfort. So one of my clients that I do voice imaging for is Grant Cardone. He's a big uh, uh, selling training, uh, uh, you know, influencer. He's got like two over 2 million Instagram followers and, you know, very big in the business space, probably one of the most world renowned sales trainers out there. And, uh, he does, uh, actually he's doing his 10 X growth con four from Vegas at Mandalay Bay in February. I may actually be coming out for that. So I'll have to come and uh, hit you up. But, um, he was just on like having those two on the same podcast was like having Tyson and Mayweather uh, oh, yeah. fight each other. Right. So they did this pod- podcast together. This is that you can sell. If it becomes big enough, you can get sponsors. You can make commercials for your sponsors, or you can do a live read, meaning you talk about them in the context of the show. Uh, typically is the best way to do it. You kind of blend it in and, and get their, their, their uh, advertisements in the context of the show. Typically, a lot of talk show hosts just read the copy points and they're done with it and they're off moving on to the, on with the show. It's a lot harder than it than it looks. But anyway, <clears throat> Jordan, it was like the biggest friggin' train wreck of a live read I had ever friggin' heard. So I went and uh, sent it to my friend. You know, remember Matt Carey? He's got his yeah. own podcast yeah. too. Calls mostly automotive marketing with Matt Wilson. And uh, I said, we got to break this thing down and just rip it to shreds. It's hilarious to listen to. It's actually a lot worse than Alan Stock doing a live read. <laughs> what, I, what I love is nobody that's going to watch this has any idea who that is. And He's going to, Alan Stock's going to be like, what's a, what's a cast pod? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Alan. I love you, Alan. <clears throat> he was like a grandfather to me. <laughs> he was like a, like a great grandfather to us. Yeah. Poor Alan. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, but listening to that live read was every nuance of what they told you not to do in radio was in this live read. Let me tell you how great this company is, all right? Okay? This one, that been, all right, okay? Okay, let me tell you something real quick, all right? Okay? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, the, that's the other blessing of podcasts. You, there's a reason why radio does the way they do things. It's because it's been found to be effective. There are very smart people that have, that have nurtured this over the years, and they have found what works best. Yeah. But in, but in podcasting, do it. Do whatever you want. Be Have fun with it. It doesn't have to be conventional. And sometimes the best things in radio that aren't conventional really work, too. So you're saying I'm being more, I'm being too uh, uh, codgery, is what you're telling me. No, I think we all slip into, I think we all slip into... Uh, Elitist. Oh, the, way, yeah. uh, the way I used to do it, get off my lawn. I think that <laughs> happens a lot, especially with us older gents. Yeah. But I, I, I think that's a big... That also hurts your creativity. You cannot, you cannot go with. Well, this is the way we used to do it with anything, right? Because it's it's forever changing, and it's you gotta you gotta keep your mind open. Um, some of those podcasting things it'll work that way. Now, like yourself, who can train people how to do better podcasts, your advice is worthwhile because what you're teaching them is what has worked in radio for decades. Yeah, so it's important, but you don't want to lose the personality or what. Some people can't read copy. Right. Some people are much better at ad-libbing and just doing what they do. And sometimes you got to figure out a way to take that ad-libbing power and, and work it into a, a script for a commercial. See, a lot of my problem exists with just simply speaking, you know, which is not good for a podcast. When no, you're- I, the speaking and, and, and I, I'm not particularly attractive. That tends to shoot <laughs> people away as well. That's why I used to do my podcast like this. That way... <laughs> That way, I'm not sure if he's attractive or not. I don't think so. Why would he have his hat on like that? But we'll give him a shot. How many podcasts do you have out? How many episodes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, roundabout number. I mean, ballpark it. 
18. <laughs> 18. I didn't, so you try <clears throat> You said you try to do it on a weekly basis. I, I think I'm subscribed to it. Uh, I do. I, I didn't say I succeeded doing it on a weekly basis. I, I have. It's hard. And, and I think that's why if you're really passionate about it for, for your business or, or whatever it might be. The way you will win is consistency and constantly doing it because there are people like me that I, I believe I have a talent and I could do something with it that it's not my primary job. I have a, a radio job and, and the reservoir of creativity I have in my brain is pretty much diverted there all the time. So anything extra, although this is part of my job in radio is to do this podcast, it's, it ends up being a secondary thing. So you right. really just got to hammer away at it. So getting back to the localization thing, you have this, you know, gold mine of ideas and content, especially with the Area 51 thing. You want to write a, did you write a parody song on it at all or do something like that? No, I, just, I didn't have to tap into no. it, you know, for, uh, for locals, it's just a little different than the rest of the world because the rest of the world has a perception about Las Vegas and that we live in, live well, in first of all, we date strippers and we eat shrimp cocktails three, three meals a week, three meals a day. Buff buffets, you know, and you swim in Lake Mead. We just what, don't. What is the name of your podcast real quick? Let me, see, let me see if I can find it. The Church of Spenstology. The Church of Spen... Oh, that's what, that was one of the ones I deleted. <laughs> Catchy, huh? <laughs> uh, the other thing is that you, you sit down to write a parody song based on the Area 51 thing. What's your starting point? I'm coming up with the Chet Buchanan show. Yeah, it's, all, it's basically through that. It's, <clears throat> it's through that. Gotcha. Um, so if I'm going to write that, mm -hmm. the first thing I'm going to do because I work for a top 40 radio station is uh, go through the biggest songs we have, the absolute biggest hits, because parody songs are only really successful when people are very, 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 very familiar with the song. So I'm going to, for my station, I'm going to try to find what song is that I can mess with the lyrics to make it about that. Right. Um, and then I go from there. If it's, if it's something else, sometimes I'll have the, sometimes I swear to God, I plant a seed that I want to do something. And then I, I swear to you, it sits in my brain and then something a day or two later will go, how about this? Without even thinking about it. it it's mm -hmm. kind of weird. Like, so if I'm doing, I'm trying to do a, a parody song like that, some other song that I didn't think of will just show up in my head. Oh, that'll work. It's not like I'm actively going, okay, okay, what song? It just, it's just, I planted a seed and I'm hoping it'll, it'll grow. And just goes from there. And then goes from there and I try to, you know, and then write the lyrics and try to make it, uh, try to find the appropriate music to make it work right. And well, it sounds familiar. Um, I've actually recently done a video for my son who's getting into band in school and has to do fundraising. So he's got those little books that have the coupons in it and discounts and all that stuff, the uh, city saver. And I, you know, everybody puts their kids book up on Facebook and Hey, it's fundraising time. Come buy a book for so-and-so. And all he has to do is sell 10. I'm sitting here going, no, let's sell 500 of them, you know? And let's see how we can make a funny commercial out of it. So <clears throat> I decided to take the old cheesy commercials of the 80s that always ended with the blue screen. Yeah, with the address. You know, <clears throat> right. You know, here's the 800 number to call. <clears throat> so I said, what if we did something like that? <clears throat> Had you dress up as like the pitch man? Um, <clears throat> I said, I'll do the voiceover for it. I'll, we'll, we'll come up with it together, write it out. And <clears throat> well, in the midst of writing it, all of a sudden I'm going, what if there were alternative uses for the book? And this is something hearkening back to something we did at Jack FM. Yeah. And I said, you know, I just kind of borrowed some of the ideas. Actually, I pretty much grabbed a lot of the ideas uh, from what we did in that one video it was a gas card giveaway. But it was, you know, people hadn't seen it in a while. It wasn't exactly creativity, but it was borrowing from a former idea. I disagree. I disagree. It was total creativity. And I saw it and, and I, I bought one just so I could try to win the car. Um, what, what's that? I, I bought one just so that I thought, I think this is working again. I bought it. No, no. I bought no. it just because, uh, I wanted to win the car. Gotcha. Yeah. The car that we weren't giving away. Right. Yeah. 
I, I like the aspect of the, uh, you know, cost $50,000 and then it was a super low price of $35,000. Yeah. But wait, there's more. Yeah. It's only $25. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, and I love that idea. We had a um, <clears throat> UNLV uh, a couple of years ago came up with a new logo mm-hmm. for, for their sports and it was widely panned and it was awful. And so I did kind of the same idea what you're talking about is I, I took the shirt and I came up with so many different uses for the new logo. And I, for instance, I used it to start your barbecue. So you could, so I set it on fire. <laughs> I used it to clean up uh, pet excrement in the park because the logo was so bad. I was demeaning it. I was used it to wash cars. I put it on as a ski mask and I, cut the logo out so you could see my real eyeball in the logo. But that type of creativity is great. And, and, uh, and it was great. You might be borrowing, but every, everything that's, that you see has been stolen. Yeah. Not, very rarely is it something completely original. You borrow from different things that have influenced you and you kind of put them together. Good artists borrow great artists steal. <laughs> that's true. Uh, but you know, a lot of this, you, you, what you're talking about really harkens back to this as well. I use the word harken a lot for some reason. Uh, and I'm holding this up. If you're familiar with the Tennessee State logo, um, yeah. the old one was this one. This one over here with the blue star, the blue and the stars on it. It was really that. good. I love oh, it. Yeah, it was a good logo. It was a great logo. So the state deciding that, oh, hey, we need to change it. Um, how much to change the logo? Uh, $65,000. Okay. Yeah, we need to change the logo. Why do we need that? Because we, we just need to change the logo. Okay, but the logo, but the logo needs to be changed. Sixty-five grand, dude. I'm putting holding this up to the camera, and those who you live in Tennessee, look at this piece of crap that they came up with. No, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's an orange. It's an orange square with the letters TN in it. Well, the the likelihood that's a totally different subject matter is the person that was responsible for that had a brother-in-law that had a graphic arts company and it was struggling uh, yeah. that's how the world works jim damn it there was another thing i wanted to ask you about that you hit on was the uh we we're talking about that oh the one thing that does come to mind for me and this is another thing that you capitalized on locality mm-hmm. um and it was right around the time that i think my, it might have been like uh when wet and wild was moving off the strip you came up with the promotion and i remember it was hilarious and people bought it hook line and sinker six well, flags under vegas yeah we did an april fool's bit um yeah and it was uh we created a commercial i created a jingle six flags under vegas whatever and the idea was hey you don't have to be outside to enjoy roller coasters we built an amusement park underground and we, we told him that it was out in the far north part of town. Yeah, the undeveloped part. <laughs> which was all desert. And <laughs> beforehand, we had comedian George Lopez on the show. And we told him the bit, and he go, can you just record that you're excited to be out for the ribbon cutting? And so he recorded this thing on the phone that, you know, George Lopez is going to cut the ribbon to open up Six Flags <laughs> up to Vegas. And we sent our stunt guy out to the middle of the desert and basically it was an April Fool's joke. And we had people, we had a line set up on the commercial. It was, a, my, it was basically my voicemail that basically said, for more information about Six Flags Under Vegas, call. And we had this number on the commercial. We ran the commercial for like a week out. We just would throw yeah. it in. When people found out it wasn't real, oh, they were <laughs> furious. And they would call and they would go, I took my kids out of school to go to this. <laughs> <laughs> That's your fault, isn't it? And the guys we sent out there were getting berated for for it not, and they were just sitting out there on lawn chairs with a cardboard sign, and there, you know, obviously it was nothing there. Yeah. I love stuff like that. That's 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 fun. That that literally just came to. I'm like, I completely forgot about that up until now, and I was going, that's that's a funny and very creative idea. And they fell for it. Not completely. No. That, that reminds you, that's, that's, that's like an element, you know, what I'm talking about with, for different podcasts, if you're doing one, come up with little elements. I mean, one of the best things that I think I heard you guys do in a long time was, uh, the old tap out routine where you ask a, a series of 
increasingly um, bothersome questions for a oh, guest. Yeah. And, you know, at some point they got to tap out. They get scored on it somehow. Does yeah. That, you guys do that? That's always fun. And, and you, you know, the um, what's that show with the guy that created Real Housewives? It's kind of what he does now. Fifth, uh, uh, I can't remember what the name of the what the name of the thing is, but it's basically he'll ask him questions and they can decide whether to tap out or not, whether they're going to answer it. And then what's the penalization answer. if they tap out? You know, there's nothing really we can do to a celebrity <laughs> on the phone from LA. Uh, we, uh, we shame them on Twitter. I don't know. Well, I mean, in terms of what was the, you come up with all these questions. Do you determine what you think is going to be the tap out question? Yeah, we had one, and and frankly, we we because it's 2019, you can't use the question anymore because it can be interpreted. It can be interpreted wrong. So back in the day, it was if you had to go gay to save the world, who would you go gay with? Now most people don't have a problem with it, but some would say, "Why do you have to go gay?" And that's not what we were we were doing. We asked this question to former President Bill Clinton. Understand? <laughs> and he laughed his behind off, and he said that he said that if. If, if he actually answered, it could ruin someone's life. But he, uh, he eventually went with George Clooney. Oh, but wow. that, that was kind of the tap out question, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not politically correct anymore. And that's fine. I got no issue with that, but that's not times change, but that was kind of the go-to end question. And what was fun at the time is you'd always, you'd have a series of different celebrities responding. And it was always interesting to say uh, who, who they would to save the world. And, and obviously uh, there's no, you know, you don't have to save the world. You can be gay. All, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can go straight to save the world as far as I'm concerned. I don't care. There was the one thing. Well, uh, what are the, uh, what was the one thing that really came to mind that, uh, that, that surprised you other than that, uh, that, you know, someone actually answered the question. Was there another, another one that came to mind? I'm going to refer back to my pickled brain. Gotcha. Uh, Cause uh, this was, this was many years ago, but, but as far as things like that, we used to do what they call phone scams and radio, and they call them different names. But we would do amazing things with those where we would just call, and I called an invention help center one time, and I had this character that was, he just, he talked like this, and he's very smart, but he might have been a child, but I'm not sure, and he just, and he, he called this invention place and claimed that he invented a time machine. And then... The invention workplace lady was great. She kept going with it, and 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 I I go I, I'm going. We are going to go see Helen Keller, and the year is 1922. And and then I had sound effect, doo -doo 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 -doo, cheesy 1950s space sound effects, and she would try to interrupt. It. Please, no talking during the time, the, the during the time travel. And we'd end up there, and Helen Keller, you are seeing a time machine. What does it look like? She doesn't see it. Let's go somewhere. But the idea that this invention lady hung on through about five minutes worth of the call <laughs> as we, we traveled through time talking to, to people uh, was funny. Very cringeworthy, humorous stuff. Uh, and and, and, and low-hanging fruit to boot. But, you know, you got yeah. to go where your brain takes you. It reminds me of when I used to listen to Opie and Anthony. And they did a oh, bit where... Stuff they would ask a guest a question and it would be like they, you know how in radio, they get you these books of people you can bring on who are experts in certain fields. And you, they were, they were always never a shortage of sex experts. Yeah. <clears throat> so Opie and Anthony, who were this uh, very popular radio talk, radio duo, they were hilarious back in the day. <clears throat> At least Anthony was. And, uh, they would bring these sex experts on and, they had a practice of asking a question. So, you know, on page 56, it says that you and the male were going to be doing this. And then all of a sudden we, we, you would go into the bedroom and, and then they just leave it like that. Hmm. So it was just that dead silence. Yeah. It was the most cringeworthy thing to listen to. And now all you could hear is the guest on the phone going, uh, Oh yeah, well, of course that was <laughs> in of itself. It was so bad to listen to, but so friggin' hilarious. I, I, I love and I, I love just simple humor. I, I, I remember listening to Robin and Maynard had a show at KZOK in Seattle, and they had this character. It was their illegitimate son, Roy Otis, mm -hmm. and, and Roy was just kind of talked off the top of his head and had a goofy voice. And they 
they did a bit with Roy off of, apparently this church was tricking kids to come in to get baptized by saying that they could play basketball. I don't understand. They could be on the basketball team, but they'd have to get baptized. Right. And Roy Otis goes into this thing, and they're, they're, it's the sound of they're filling the, the baptism thing. But it sounds like somebody's peeing. <laughs> and and all, all I can tell you is I had to pull over because I'm like, this was the funniest thing I ever heard, and I am just beside myself by something that was just so simple and stupid. Occasionally, uh, you had mentioned sound effects, and I was always pretty good at whipping them together, and I should have been like in another life a Foley artist, you know? And there was this one sound effect that I put together was a car screeching and then it hit something. You'd hear the glass breaking and then the horn blare that, you know, and in the radio studio where I worked in Vegas, you had the phone patch. And for some reason I would get some telemarketer calling through, I'd answer the call and they'd start going in their pitch and I would play this over, (laughs) (laughs) over the, uh, the phone call. While they were trying to make their pitch, and I'd be like, hold on a minute. And then all of a sudden, they'd hear the, the tire screeching, and then the, the impact, and then the, the horn. That's and I'd hear them. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, and I'd God. suddenly go into the microphone going, can, can, you, can you call my one? Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> you know what? And, they're good. and typically uh, now, they're not anywhere near you. So... And I don't even think there they use nine one one. I think they have a totally different set of numbers. Yeah. Well, this was my brother um, called me up. I did that to him one time, and he he, <laughs> he didn't appreciate it, <clears throat> but uh, he did, and then realized how funny it was. So he had me do it to a friend of his. He says, "I need you to go to call this guy, leave a voicemail, and explain to him that you're a client, and that you're waiting for him to call you back, and you get you're getting really annoyed the fact that you haven't that he hasn't called you back, and then play that sound effect." So I did. <clears throat> I never met this guy. My brother comes out to Vegas uh, with some of his work friends, including the guy I did this to. And he got the guy, he he introduces to me, to him, to me. And he goes, you're the guy. I said, what do you mean? He goes, the guy on the voicemail with the car crash. I go, (laughs) yeah, yeah. He's come here. (laughs) He's like, I called every hospital. (laughs) And I was trying to find out what the hell happened to you. <laughs> I love stuff like that. There's a thing on, there's a thing on Twitter right now. It's uh, I think she's an Australian woman. She mm-hmm. she goes through this process. She takes her hand and she shows it. She takes this finger and she tapes it down, and then she lays it on the cutting block like this. And she takes. Oh, it, I saw that. She yeah. takes the carrot, and then she covers it. It looks like raspberry jam or something like that. It looks awful. <laughs> then. She stops, she looks at the camera, and she takes a knife, and she slams it on the, on the cutting board. And then, help, come in here. And her kids, who were probably 13 and 11, yeah. and it looks like her face, she chopped her finger off. And mm-hmm. those kids, she's like, get a towel, get a towel. And they're like, the head, and the whole time, ah, ah. <laughs> oh. That is the most awesome thing I've ever seen. <laughs> At the same time, horrible. Oh, it's absolutely. And all oh, those kids will be scarred for life. No, <laughs> they have to realize that they have the greatest mom on the planet. My kids have been getting into this whole scaring thing. So they come up behind me and they'll try and scare me. So I'm going to start making Instagram stories of me scaring them. And so it's like, you know, you think about creativity, you think about guys like Bat Dad, right? Right. What a Nuts. brilliant idea that was. Amazing. Hilarious. Has, have you done it yet? Because that sounds that sounds like a great idea. I've done it a couple of times, but I'm waiting for somebody to, you know, accuse me of child abuse because, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, because my kids are so scare prone to my son will, I mean, I'll just sit there and look at him and I'll go huh, like that. And he's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know? And it's, it's probably something I should do. I actually bought a Thanos glove. And I wanted to start a character of being Thanos where, you know, if if Cammy didn't do her homework and be like, I'm going to snap half of your homework into oblivion if you don't get it done, you know, stuff like that and just make videos out. It's And again, okay, it's a great idea, but when am I going to find the time to actually offload the video from the phone 
Yeah. Do the effects editing on it, and then oh, oh it's just a pain in the butt. That's a lot. It'd of be work. hilarious. It that, is uh, that video for your kid's coupon book. I could tell that took a lot of time. Uh, you know, we shot it over a weekend. Uh, we wrote it up during the week. I said we'll shoot it this weekend. We took a Saturday and just went ahead and did it. Um, and I think by maybe mid Monday, I had it all buttoned up. It's a lot Not of work. Bad. It's good. Though. good. Thank you. Appreciate it. But man, I know we're uh, we've gone a long time. Good to catch up with you. Always good. And hope uh, everybody who's listening, uh, you please get past the fact that I'm a little rusty at this and I've been all over the place. Um, Spence, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, you? Twitter, Spenceology, Instagram, Spenceology. I have a Facebook account, but I don't use it because I don't like it. Are you on Instagram as well, you said? Yeah, Spence, S-P-E-N-C-E-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Spenceology.com too is my website. I've got a bunch of comedy and songs and stuff like that on there. I'll put it down in the description as well. Um, listening to the morning show, can people hear it? Um, virtually? Yeah, go, uh, radio. Uh, radio. Uh, com. Um, it's ninety eight point five KLUC, the Chet Buchanan show. Um, radio. dot com. It's, uh, it's, it's there. You can check it out anytime. Want subscribe, download. It's a good show. You got anything you want to plug? You selling anything? <clears throat> We're thinking about refinancing our house. Does that? <laughs> does that <qualify>? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, rates are good. We think we'll get a 3.375, but reduce down to a 15 year. 3.375 isn't bad. I may have to refinance mine. Yeah. Anyway, now we're getting boring if we haven't already. <laughs> but I thank you for listening to the JMVO weekly primer, which is now weekly issue or monthly issue, if you will. Uh, definitely subscribe, like, rate, comment, tell your friends about it. Um, hit us up on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. Uh, pick your poison at Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com forward slash podcast. And uh, I thank you for listening. And uh, thank you, Spence, for being on with me. This is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com forward slash podcast.